Okay, everyone can see the screen? Okay, perfect. Okay, so for today's agenda, we did email everyone on the listserv. So um, if you know anyone else who wants to sign up, definitely sign up on the listserv, listserv for any other updates. But today's agenda is going to be um, foreign currency conversion. Um, I wouldn't say there's anything new to it, but just a review. Um, we also have um, a new page up on our website, the COVID reimbursement guidance page. Um, we want to review reimbursement for flight credits. Um, also talk about car services. We will also have a little poll um, to mention about possibly combining our travel classes. So we have two classes. Um, e travel and policy and procedures, but we'll again do a survey later in the meeting, and then we'll do a Q and A for any questions everyone has. All right. Okay. Okay, and then um, Renee, you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sam. Hello, everybody. So we're going to go over the foreign currency conversion policy. As Sam said previously, no changes, but we just wanted to remind you guys that um, our policy on foreign currency conversions is whenever you have an expense report or you have an expenses that were purchased in a foreign currency, we will need to have them converted to U.S. dollar for Ariba. Uh, there are a few options for how to follow this policy. You can use credit card statements or and or exchange rates on receipts if you get those. But more commonly, we get currency quotes from Awanda or XE. It's another option. And we allow for you, if you have multiple expenses in a, that were purchased in a foreign currency, you can just use one, um, one currency quote from either the date of payment or the first or last day of travel. And we will just uh, apply that to the rest. And this will all need to be attached to the ER as an attachment. We I see a lot of times that uh, it's put in as comment and we would like to see them as attachments. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Renee. So um, under our policy under the website and then under policies and procedures, I believe there is going to be a new page called COVID reimbursement guidance page. Um, it's not too big of a page, but again, um, we just want to talk about reimbursement overall um, when someone gets COVID or someone wants to quarantine before and after if they were in a place that has high amounts of COVID. Um, we just want to make sure that everyone in just general practice, um, UW is not going to reimburse anyone who does a self-quarantine um, before or after their trip. Um, we will not be paying for the lodging or any of those meals per diem before and after. Um, again, the self-isolation is up to the traveler. Um, and then unless it's a COVID uh, quarantine requirement of that country. Um, as you know, please, again, research where you're going and making sure if you need to stay or quarantine for five days before, uh, most of the time it's before, um, please make sure you let your department know um, to make sure they are okay with paying the extra lodging. Um, a lot of the um, COVID questions we get is that a lot of people get COVID during their trip. Of course, lodging uh, and meals per diem are going to be reimbursed um, for those uh, that do get COVID. So please make sure you, again, communicate with your department of how long the quarantine will be. Sometimes airlines have guidelines as well. Um, apparently, um, certain airlines will have like a five extra five or even an extra 10 day quarantine of where you are before they allow you back on the flight. And as it says, uh, no added expenses due to COVID precautions that lead to personal preferences are not reimbursable. 
Um, if it's a medical reason, you can see the ADA page on our website for more information. And then uh, lastly, for COVID testing, a lot of people ask us if COVID testing is reimbursable. Uh, the bottom line is that if it's required by the UW business or the host of the UW business, um, you may get reimbursed for it. Um, it is not an immunization on Ariba. It is going to be under the non-incidental supplies. Um, please make sure you also attach a receipt. It is required. Um, so please be aware of that. Um, but very, uh, all that information, again, is on the website on our new page. Okay. Okay. And then reimbursement for flight credit. So we did update the reimbursement for flight credit a little bit. So if you go to our book and pay page and you scroll down all the way to reward programs, um, back then we had a little bit more stricter policy on um, credits that come from our credits that have been used to pay for flights. If you have a credit, from a previous flight, um, please make sure, and you're gonna use that to pay for a new UTA business flight, you would have to attach the previous flight that the credit came from onto your ER um, due to um, auditing. So if an auditor looks at an ER and they see it's paid by credit, you need to show proof um, that it was not from a reward or some sort of point system that you got it from and that you actually um, got it from a previous canceled flight. Okay, so please be aware of that. Um, super simple. I know it could be a little complicated looking for um, a credit that was from back then. Um, a lot of it is due to COVID, a lot of canceled flights from a year or two years ago. So please make sure um, if you have any extra information, like it says confirmation of the cancel flight or when the flight's turned into a credit, please attach that as well to the ER as extra documentation. Okay. And please let us know if we're going too fast. Okay. Okay. Alrighty, car services. So if you were present at last quarter's info meeting, you will know that a uh, question came up about car services and what kinds of car services are allowed and to where and where we draw the line. So I know on our website, it says essentially both things that yes, it is reimbursable and no, it's not reimbursable. And that's a little bit confusing, <laughs> which we should probably we'll work on updating that. But however, um, we did talk to our state contact at uh, Wa State, and we've the policy per the state government is that car services are allowable to locations besides just the business location and lodging within reason. Now. Determining the reasonableness of a car service, will we will leave up to the department. So if you would like help determining if your traveler's car service was reasonable or not, you can ask us, but ultimately that will be down to your department's discretion if you guys think it's reasonable or not, because, um, you know, frankly, there's a lot of different situations. There's a lot of gray and we can't quite, uh, you know, we can't provide a blanket answer for everything. So if you have any questions on that, you can email us at travel at uw.edu or call us. And real quick, I see Adam says, what do you mean by car services? Car services we define as Ubers, Lyfts, um, taxis, any service for a car where you're paying someone else to drive. So technically limos would be included in that. Although if that's reasonable or not, that's uh, you know that's what falls into the reasonableness question. And we will get to all questions at the end. I think we're almost done. Sam. Oh, 
Okay. Um, like Renee said, um, there's a bit of questions. We will get to them, no worries. Um, but right now we're going to do a short poll um, about combining our travel classes. So as I said earlier, we have two classes. We do them in about a month, um, depending how busy travel is getting, we'll uh, increase the amount of classes we have every month. Um, we just finished, I believe ours, uh, last week. And then we have another one, um, another two, I guess, at the end of this month. So don't forget to sign up. Um, it is on the front page, or if you go to the training page on our website, it'll be there for you guys. But anyways, long story short, um, we were thinking about combining uh, our classes, um, the e-travel and the policy procedures. Um, it will be a longer class, as it says on the slide, it could be four to six hours. Um, if you've been to any of our classes, we do schedule them longer, um, but they do tend to take over an hour and a half, maybe two hours max. But if you think in the future for future people in your department that are coming to do a class, if you think it'd be better just to take one long class instead of two um, classes, I guess, in general, um, please let us know. If you have any extra explanation to pressing yes or clicking yes or no, you can let us know in the chat as well. So I see we have some comments in the chat that people are sending directly to us. Daniel says, can you offer the benefits of combining these classes? So essentially the benefits would just be you could uh, attend one class and learn everything you need instead of having to wait. Um, yeah, I, we, a lot of times we get a lot of questions when we're doing our e-travel class about policy. And we always say to save those for the policy class. And uh, interestingly, it looks like the poll is split 50-50. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark says the class should be 90 minutes at most. Diane says um, too much information at what time. Um, so Mark, the class length already usually takes about 90 minutes. So we would be combining it because we would have the same kind of material, but combined. Yeah, we don't have an outline of how that combined class would be. But since if we did like exactly mix our e-travel and policy procedures, it's definitely going to run over 90 minutes for sure. Either way. Um, once a month, one class. Uh, yeah, we would likely offer the combined class more frequently. All right, we have 171 answered of 201. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're going to... Oh. Oh, my God, 133. Okay, I'll give another 10 seconds for any last-minute votes. Will the classes change when FT starts? Yes. <laughs> yes, it will yes, change. Yes, it will likely change. Yeah. Or at least the e-travel one will change. Mm -hmm. I mean, this... Travel is complicated, not a good idea to rush. True. It's a lot. Um, I think it would be great to combine as it would help reinforce travel policies and travel processing. Also very true. Um, a lot of pros and cons. Is there a reason why the classes aren't available 
are already recorded. Um, the reason why we don't have the classes, or at least the policies and procedure class um, recorded is sometimes they do change over time. The government will change their policy or federal government. Um, so we don't want to make sure everyone just sticks to that single class. For e-travel, we actually do have it up um, on the training page um, under a YouTube link. There's actually a breakdown of that class as well. Um, it's just an hour class um, on there. So for any e-travel, it is always up there um, until we get the work day or one up. But um, we do uh, allow everyone to have, like if they ask for, we do give the slides for the policies and procedures class. We just also recommend um, just to be aware that they could change over time. Okay. Some people changing their votes, I see. Oh. So it looks like mainly the yeses do have it. Yeah, the 54 and 40 stuff. Okay. Um, maybe another option, option them up back to back so people have the option of taking both at once. That's pretty much what we do now. Yeah. Unless you mean like Daniel, you went like in the same day back to back. So that's fine too. That's also an option. Okay. Oh, the same day. Yeah. That would be, I also think we like QA in our course, allows the courses to evolve more naturally. We haven't, we, just to be clear with everyone, we don't have like a clear slip plan for combining them together just yet. Um, but if you have like options or anything that would help us, that'd be great too, since um, a lot of people from your department or that you're gonna send to these classes would be participating. Um, okay, I'm gonna end the poll. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. There you go. All right. So it looks like the yeses do have it, but um, I don't know. People have a lot of good feedback. Good things. They good feedback they brought up. So I think we could probably table this for now, and Sam, Teresa, and I we can talk and see what options we might present. Mm -hmm. We might have a poll we can send out over the listserv. Yeah, I think the class would be pretty long, difficult to fit into people's calendars. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a few ways we could go about it. But I think now seeing the results from this poll, I think we could, Sam and I and Teresa, we could meet and discuss. Mm -hmm. I would never be able to. All right. Okay. Let's move on to questions. Looks like there's a lot. Okay. Sam, I think we can alternate. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just pull. I saw one from Eunice. Eunice asked, um, if the department approves, if the country requires quarantine and the department approves of it, the question is, will the travel office allow it? If the quarantine is required, um, like let's say you go to Japan um, and they require a five-day quarantine and, you're, uh, and if you didn't have the quarantine required, you would just go straight to business. Um, I believe it should be possible to get a per diem for that. Which one did you answer? Eunice's. Okay. I'll just go from the top here. So Kelsey's question, 
Is there a distance minimum requirement for mileage reimbursement? If someone is remote working within Seattle and is required to come to campus for meetings four times a year, can they be re reimbursed for travel? Now that would depend on whether or not this person is has a hybrid agreement or if they are 100% remote. If 100% remote, they could be reimbursed to their travel to campus, but if they are hybrid, they would not be able to because that would be considered their commute. Okay. As more out of state hires, is that the one you answered? I know oh, I'm from the top. The next one would be uh, Siva's. Oh, okay. Steven asks um, for air and hotel expense reimbursement. Can we submit post event? And if so, um, is there a deadline to submit requests? Um, there's no deadline technically to submit a reimbursement for anything. Um, there might be an issue with per diem. Um, some people have reimbursed stuff from last year or even in a sense, five years ago. Um, there is a link on the website showing if you can don't see your per diem on Ariba uh, right now, and you can just follow that. Um, but yeah, for this reimbursement in general, air, hotel, meal per diem, um, you can get reimbursed um, after the event happens. Or I believe air and hotel can be reimbursed prior to as well. All right. See, this next question, what kind of documents do you accept for expense reimbursement, such as food and air tickets? So because we treat meal per diem as an allowance, we don't require receipts for food. And air tickets, we need fully itemized itineraries. You can find this information on our website as well. Um, Skylar asks what the PCA code for COVID testing is. Um, I think Skylar meant object code. Um, the object code looks like it's 0416. Yeah, I don't think you have the option to change the object mm -hmm. code. That's automatically set when you choose. Mm -hmm. Oh, you would choose non-incidental supplies, Ariba, for COVID testing. Okay, Kelly says, is there a due date for submitting reimbursements? As in, if my travel date was on January 1st, 2022, do I need to submit my reimbursement within a given amount of time? Thanks. I think that's the uh, same question Sam answered previously. Technically, no, but the sooner the better, I would say. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And then Anne, if Anne asks if the cancel flight is good until the end of 2023, do we need to reimburse um, or is it still good to use it? Like a flight credit, I assume. Um, you can technically reimburse it now or later. If you reimburse it now, um, let's say you are basically giving up that credit to your department. Um, and um, technically you're not allowed to use that credit for anything but a future UW business flight. Um, we usually, I usually recommend people to do it after so you can ensure that flight has been, the flight credit has been used for a UW business flight. Um, so it just depends on what, uh, I guess the department prefers. So I would check with your department because sometimes they have stricter policies on credits. John Salos asks, is there a parking fee limit by a certain dollar threshold? I've seen expensive parking fees for larger U.S. cities. Uh, no, that is a situation where we will be leaving it up to your discretion if you think it is reasonable or not, or, you know, depends on if there's a receipt. Uh, yeah, so if it is reasonable, if you believe it is reasonable, then yes. Well, then there, no, no limit. <laughs> 
Okay. Stephanie asks, are all tips for car services, Lyft, Uber, et cetera, reimbursable or capped for reasonableness? Kind of similar. Um, so all tips sh uh, for service should be reimbursed through um, meals and inc incidental expenses. Um, so that is technically whatever in there, again, is an allowance, uh, meal per diem, basically. Um, so Actually, Sam, um, um, car service tips are allowed to be combined with car services. Oh, is it? Yeah, that's the only one. Oh, wait, sorry. Okay. Um, but there's no limit, technically, of how much you can tip, but I would just give a reasonable amount or um, nothing like crazy um, that your department might flag you on or restrict you on would be recommended. Yep. Jared Lemon asks, "Could when able, could you go over travel packets for conferences? Uh, not sure I follow, Jared. Do you mean like package deals? Jared Lemon. Okay, we can come back to that one. Harmony Wolf says, can we reimburse staff for hotel lodging before they have been charged for it? They have the reservation. Uh, the only time that we can reimburse staff for lodging in advance is if it was paid in full because... Uh, we will need a fully itemized folio for the reimburse for lodging per diem. And typically the only time you will get that is after you have completed, after the traveler has completed the uh, travel and checked out, or if it's prepaid, in which case they get a prepaid receipt. So uh, technically just with a pure reservation, no. Well, actually, there's the option of uh, per diem lodging advance. So actually, technically, yes, I correct myself here. Hmm. Uh, Max asks, I have an individual who we pre-reimbursed for an international flight. They could not go due to passport issues, we reimburse them for the flight and registration. They want or do not want to pay us back for what they are reimbursed for us and give us the flight voucher. Is this okay? The flight voucher is also worth more than we reimbursed for the reimbursed for as they have created seats. So they want that deducted from what they have to reimburse as well. Um, for you, Max, it would, I guess the reimbursement situation would depend on why, uh, um, what is the passport issue? You don't have to discuss it here. You can definitely let us know in more detail, um, through email if you want, but, um, usually for reimbursement, um, if something happens, like a visa issue, like the visa expired and they didn't notice till they had to leave, um, that would be on the fault of the traveler. And technically, those kind of things shouldn't be technically reimbursed for since it is their fault. Um, it is also part of our change and cancellation policy um, as well. Um, um, Reminder, please put all questions in the Q&A section. Mm -hmm. Let's back. Um, but yeah, I would determine whether, let me see if you said anything. It was a pre-embarrassment. Did it change anything? If the flight was canceled and it was due to the fault of the traveler, and you already pre, pre reimbursement, they would have to write a check to the university. Um, 
since they didn't go on that trip, um, due to the fact that they are not within uh, the change and cancellation policy. So it depends on what their passport issues were, if it was expired already or they didn't have a passport when they were supposed to leave. I'm not sure what their situation was, um, but if it doesn't find a follow the change and cancellation policy, they're not allowed to get reimbursed for that. Um, even if it's a pre-reimbursement, they would still, the department should ask them to write a check to the university and pay the university back. Okay. All right, Jean E. Branham says, several employees have traveled overseas and took personal time. Does the comparison flight for the dates of the conference begin and end dates? Also, what if they change the initial country while they are traveling for their personal time? Is that an issue? So uh, if they're traveling and they take personal time, we will just need to see a comparison that uses the dates of what business would have been if they hadn't taken personal time. So if the conference was from the 5th to the 10th, then, and they take personal time after, we will just need to see the comparison for a five-day span or the 5th to the 10th, preferably, if you did it at the time of booking. Uh, if they change the initial country, that is not an issue with the comparison because the comparison will still need to be for the same place as what the business was. So, uh, yeah. Okay, well, we already answered that. Oh, I think we answered that one, yeah. John Sells asks, I might be confused about the car services compliance. Can travelers be reimbursed for travel required from the hotel, conference hotel, to the conference location if they're different locations or from the airport to the business location? Um, yes, to both those. So they can be reimbursed if it's um, from the conference hotel to the conference location if they're not in the same place, because um, that's uh, going from one temporary location, temporary duty station to technically another. And then um, from the local airport from SeaTac, for example, to, or wherever you're going to the business location is also reimbursable if you take an Uber from a hotel or from the airport to the conference hotel or conference location. Okay. Christy K asks, is the policies and procedures class aimed at newcomers? Might be good to have a set time for the travel so people can come just for that. So it's not exactly set or aimed at newcomers, although generally it's newcomers are the ones attending. A lot of times people will go for refreshers. So it's just kind of general overview of all of the policies and procedures. But um We'll we'll meet and we'll look through what people said in the chat here and see what ideas we can come up with to proceed regarding that one. Yeah. Okay, Siva asks, should the travel approval form be submitted before the travel? Yes. Um, so any pre-trip approvals, anything to get the travel approved should always be done beforehand. Um, so there's a, no issue with your department. Um, can it be submitted post-travel? Um, we don't recommend submitting it post-travel. Um, you should always be approved to go on any trip, um, as especially if, whether it's international or it's outside the Washington, Oregon, or Idaho area. A pre-trip approval is always mandated. Um, can you please uh, share a link to the travel proof forms that uh, need our approver manager signatures. Um, we do, I believe we may have a sample on our website, but um, most departments have their own specialized form for pre-trip approvals. So I would check with your uh, fiscal specialist or whoever takes care of travel in your department um, to give you those uh, travel approval forms. But I believe we might have one on the website. I'll, I'll put a link to our forms page mm -hmm. in the chat. All right, uh, Carrie Goodman asks, would we still have quarterly policy update meetings separately? That's my concern. You mean like uh, like this one? We, yeah, we would still have that separately. We would just have the uh, 
theoretically we'd have e travel and policies classes together. We don't consider this one to be a class. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, Venus asks, so the answer is yes. Um, it says yes for now. Um, again, like Serenity said, we will determine that through possibly another survey to see like what really the plus and minuses are for combining the class because a lot of people um, want to, but also they find out the time is too long. There's a lot of stuff to discuss still, but right now the poll just says yes. Um, let's see. Um, just a question. Oh, Jay's yeah. question about j train travel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the basis for comparison is still, you know, whether or not it's cheaper versus plane travel, like going to Oregon. Usually train travel is cheaper going to Oregon than, um, than flying. But uh, we kind of take more of a hands-off approach on that as well. So, but it would be coded as rail on Ariba, if that answers your question. And we answered we answered that one. Um, if combining the class, Cindy asks, Cindy Lisa asks, if combining the class bringing to two sessions on different days would be easier to manage, like pod courses that are done in two sessions. Okay. Noted. Um, okay. Khalid Luden says some travelers use a transportation company for all the trips and make one single payment in order to reimburse an Ariba. Is this a good practice to create one line of expense or make several lines of expenses for each trip? I think that might depend on how your department prefers to do it for their budget purposes, but uh, we frankly, we have no preference. Right, Sam? Can you think of any preference we might have? One single payment. Um, preferably, it's, I would say it's probably best to have them separately. Um, I'm not sure if this is like a kind of a package deal situation, um, but it's better just to have them separately. So it's easier for the department or the funding to understand what's happening and where the money is going. But um, again, I would just check, like Renee said, with your department to see what's best. Um, sometimes it's easier when it's all split apart and organized, but some people think it's organized when it's all together. So, Yeah, whatever your department's preference is. I lost where we were. Okay. Um, See. Okay. Anne, I'm not Anne. Anne Bush. What documentation is required for com, uh, um, comparison airfare? I know it's a screenshot for a similar flight, which should be captured. Um, so the comparison airfare, um, we do have it available to do while you're booking AK prior to the trip or after, we as travel services highly recommend to do it while you're booking because um, sometimes people get confused of how to look um, as this question is stating. Um, when you're looking for comparison um, post-flight, we just recommend doing it the same days of the week of the business dates. So if, you're, if there are travelers on business Monday through Saturday, you should look for a Monday through Saturday flight. Um, you should also look for the same amount of time the business states were. Sometimes, depending if it's a flight on the East Coast or a flight internationally, you could add a day or two to for the flight because flights are long. It could be a five-hour flight. It could be a 14-hour flight. Um, and obviously, you can't get that done in one day and go to a conference as well sometimes. But usually, same days of the week, same distance, and then... Um, we also recommend the same time, um, the original, like the distance or the time that was booked out. So for example, if you booked a flight three months, if you booked the original flight three months from 
um, the, the, the start of the conference. You should also look three months out. I know it can be a little difficult because some people, uh, the summer is over. And so like fall prices might be different from summer prices. Um, again, you can adjust accordingly. Some people want to do, if they bought it in June, they'll go to June next year and look for it and compare. That's fine as well. But preferably we like to look for, especially the same days of the week and the same distance or same amount of days in the trip for the most part. Um, but again, the easiest way to do that is just to do it before the trip starts as you're booking the actual flight. Um, so you don't have to rush into doing it later or get it rejected on a year for it. But yeah. Uh, Anne has a follow-up question as well. I marked it. Uh, it's right below L. Um, Backman's. Yeah. Follow-up for the Q airfare. Would it be acceptable find exact the flight on the airline website that shows the business days. And uh, yes, so that would be perfect. <laughs> that would be the most ideal situation. So I just recommend doing that for everyone all the time. Just doing it before you book so you don't have to rush in to figure out all that information post-trip. Because sometimes people don't reimburse after trip, like right after they reimburse months later when they forget. So um, highly recommend. L. Bachman says, aren't travel reimbursements considered taxable income if they're claimed after a certain amount of time? I recall receiving that information from travel services a few years ago. Yeah, that is technically the IRS policy on it. Um, we currently do not have that policy adopted. Uh, we are working towards it, but currently there's no limit. But uh, per the IRS guidelines, it is it can be considered taxable income but as i said we will not be enforcing that for now and uh, okay it looks like jared did follow up on his packet question uh okay so travel packets for travelers to conferences those created based on booking through christopherson Uh, I'm not sure what you want us to go over these, frankly. If they're cre created by Christofferson, usually that functions as the airfare itinerary. If that is, um, if they're taking airfare. Yeah. I think, Jared, you can, uh, if you could type in the chat to us. Give us a little bit more context. We can answer your question. Yeah. And then Sue is just following up to L. Bachman. And Sue is totally correct. Thank you, Sue. Okay. And then Jessica asks if there are several car service receipts that need to be reimbursed, is it okay to combine the grand total for all the receipts? onto one line item in Ariba, or should we be entering each receipt as one line item? Preferably, we would rather to be more organized to do it one per line item, but you can discuss with your department if they would like to put it all as one. It is an option as well, but most of the time um, preferred is to do it separately. Um, so there isn't any confusion and the funding doesn't have to calculate all of it together um, or an auditor per se has to calculate all of the receipts together to get that line item total. Um, but again, um, they're both, they are both allowed as an option, but preferred is to do it separately per, uh, I guess, receipt. Okay, I answered that one. Uh, okay, Kelsey says, as more out-of-state hires happen, how does the travel policy impact these people? If they are required to be on campus periodically for department meetings, can they be reimbursed for the travel? Uh, that depends on their agreement, frankly. If they are fully remote, then they can be reimbursed for travel 
to campus. But if they are required to go to campus, then it's likely they have a hybrid agreement, in which case that would be considered their commute, in which they, they would not be able to be reimbursed for that. Hope that answers your question. Okay. Uh, Kali asks, Logic for Diem, what if a traveler has stayed in a hotel that charged over the allowed rate per night? For example, the allowed rate or the per diem rate is 160, but the traveler claims 180 because that's what they were charged. Um, so most likely for any overages for lodging, you would have to find an exception um, per diem. Um, there's six exceptions on the website. Um, most of the time it's going to be a conference location um, or conference hotel and or a lower cost overall is the other option. Um, it, technically, if you cannot or the traveler cannot fit the hotel into one of those reasonings or the origin to one of those reasonings, it's not reimbursable. Um, but that's the only way that the traveler can get the full reimbursement if they do have an overage per diem. Okay. Eric B. asks, my department has required screenshots of bank statements for things like conference registrations that don't show paid with credit card with the last four digits. Is this something required by the travel office? Yes, I believe it is. We require a receipt for these kinds of things if they are if they are le if they are more than $75 which i find typically they are so um yeah if there's no receipt that shows proof of payment then we require proof of payment in a different form and uh, something I should note as well, if your department has a requirement that is stricter than ours, technically you still have to follow your department's policy. Our department policies can be stricter than our policies, but they cannot be looser. Okay, and then Ruth Levy asks, can a travel be reimbursed to and from a restaurant distance? distance from a conference. Um, I believe this is, I think the same question we had before, or we mentioned it in our last meeting that caused a little bit of controversy as you could say. Um, we will not reimburse, like, I just wanna make it clear for everyone, we will not reimburse um, a hotel to dinner, hotel to lunch at all. I may know, again, if you were here last uh, meeting, it caused a lot of, um, issues in the chat, um, we will not reimburse for that unless it is UW business related. So you're going to meeting, you're going to the conference, you're going to, or you're going to the airport, you can reimburse for those car services, but not to your meals. So just wanna make that clear for everyone. Mary Martha McNally says, does this answer still apply to whether there is a time limit on submitting reimbursements? Travel is working on a 60-day limit per IRS policy and hope to implement in the near future. Oh, I think. Yeah, it's similar to what. Yeah, I think we answered that question. What per diem rate do you use if the traveler has multi-city international meetings as well as personal days? Well, in that case, you will need to use the per diem for each different city. So if they are claiming meal per diem for the entire time and they are traveling to different cities the entire time, yeah, they will you'll need to submit a you'll need to separately itemize those for each city. So each city gets its own line item and its own per diem rate. Okay, and then Ruth asks, Ruth Levy asks, I recently had a traveler book lodging through a web app, hotel.com. Um, the company refused to give a folio and the hotel said they can't either what to do. 
Um, usually, um, usually what would happen, um, usually you should receive a confirmation email from, um, the service, the third party you're using. Um, we just recommend travelers booking on a website that is very popular, like for example, Expedia, Kayak and such, if they are gonna book through a third party instead of like the actual hotel or through a travel agency. Um, sometimes depending on the situation, um, we would usually have to ask that hotel. I know you already asked the hotel if they can. I would still push on whether the hotel can give you the receipt. Um, uh, we don't do perjury statements for that. Um, like a last case scenario may be um, a credit card statement, but um, I would definitely reach out to the service and see if they can give you some sort of email at least with the charges on it um before doing anything uh, like a, a credit card statement as the last resort for the receipt okay monica Wu says airfare policy is defined as the lowest economical airfare is this to give full discretion to the department on when this means Airfare policy is defined as lowest economic airfare because we require travelers to to fly booking with the lowest logical fly booking at the lowest logical cost. So, you know, so you should be flying ideally as cheaply as possible, unless otherwise approved. Okay. Max says, since the individual I mentioned does not have a valid valid reason, should we rec still recover the flight voucher? Um, should the value of the voucher be deducted from what needs to be paid back from the department? Um, yes, the department should recover um, and the voucher for sure. And then any other expenses that were for that um, for that trip that was technically canceled, um, anything that was prepaid to the them should be um, again written a check to the university since um, they don't have a UW business reason why their passport didn't go through or what whatever reason the passport caused for their trip to be canceled. So if it again. Um, I would ask them to write a check to the university since uh, they don't have a valid reason. Um, yeah. Robert asks, can you reimburse if lodging was paid for by spouse of UW Traveler, hotel folios and spouse name? I think that that, that depends on if we are getting extra cost do if it costs more due to the spouse attending i assume the spouse attended if if they're paying so if that is true technically we could only reimburse for the um for the part that is from the for the actual UW traveler unless it's found that the spouse is also on UW business. Good questions. Um, Anthony asks, with a hybrid work situation, is the mileage from home to airport to still reimbursable? So if you're going on a trip, a uh, UW business trip, um, the mileage from home to airport is reimbursable. But if it's a hybrid situation and you're going from home to work, it is not since that's part of um, the traveler's commute. But home to airport should be reimbursable. Yep. 
Betsy Bradsby says the conference has free shuttles between ho hotel and conference center. Would car service between hotel and conference be reimbursable? Should the traveler choose that method instead? That's a good question. I think that is something that we would leave up to your department's determination to reimburse. We don't have any specific policy on that, such as how we do for provided meals. But uh, yeah, I think that one would be up to your discretion. On Ellen, um, is travel insurance paid uh, for by the user department? That is for you to determine that is, that is insurance against canceled flights. So have you paid for travel insurance on your flight um uw is not going to be reimbursed for that um because the flight and or the traveler is already protected by the can changing cancellation policy so um regardless if you buy the travel insurance you won't be reimbursed for that or the traveler won't, won't be reimbursed for it but if something happens that follows the change in cancellation policy, the travel will be reimbursed either way if they didn't buy the insurance, for example. But again, just insurance in general, we recommend not buying because it's not reimbursable. Eunice Yang says, my question is about the quarantine per diem reimbursement if travel office allows it. Actually, Sam, I think you handled her initial yeah. question. Mm -hmm. We are the travel office, so if we uh wait, Sam, what what did you say to her initial question? If it is required. Yeah, if, if it is required. Yeah. And you have documentation, then yeah. we will allow it, yes. Um Grace asks, Grace Lee asks, would there be a copy, will there be a record of your response to solve these questions? If so. Could we receive a copy? I mean, there's the uh, recording of the meeting. There is the recording of the meeting. I believe there is some sort of copy um, on Zoom because I remember have receiving one before. And if we do get it, we will um, email you. Okay. Okay. All right, Jay says, thanks for your answer. Oh, that's not a question. Sounds good, Jay. Cindy says, do you have any UW FT updates to share with us? From what I've heard, travel compliance will become centralized rather than managed from the department level. If that is the case, then I'm hoping the travel team will be more than three people. Uh, well, we'll still be three people. That's not going to change. But um, not anything that's really new, per se, but uh, it will... Travel compliance will be centralized in that it'll be centralized at a shared space level. Departments will have shared environments. For example, the department, the School of Arts and Sciences will have its own shared environment and all departments below that will use the arts and sciences shared environment, including the fiscal specialists and compliance analysts in within that shared environment. So that will be expanded and then we will be the step above that answering questions to shared environment peoples more will come on that we're going to have a demo from uwft this february and i think uh attendance is encouraged and if you save all your questions for uwft for for them they're better <laughs> at answering that there will likely be more that will change as well. Um, Raquel asks, a non the person came to Seattle for a conference and rented a car to get to the hotel, to conference, and back to the airport. The car rental was paid with uh, their own funds. Will the car rental be reimbursable? The hotel parking, street parking being reimbursable? Yes. Um, since they're um, coming from their home, to a temporary uh, work location, which is the conference in Seattle, all of that um, car rental 
um, parking will be reimbursable. Robert says, how does one tell what car services are used for, especially if no receipts are required under 75? Yeah, this, uh, we're going to deliberate on this one and we're going to, we'll send something in the, we'll send an email clarification about car services further in the newsletter. So, or through our listserv. So please keep a lookout. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is again, we're referring to car services uh we will deliberate once again internally and get back to you on that one. Oh, and jay oh jay i saw this ticket come in actually renting a larger car due to shortage okay i think if you can provide documentation of that that there are no smaller cars available, then you could have a justification for car type other. But uh, I will give a more detailed answer in the, my response to your ticket. Okay. Max, as Max continues with, I get they have to write a check. Do they have to write a check for the full amount? or the full amount minus the value of the flight voucher. Um, we reimbursed a thousand, the flight voucher was 500, they write a check for a thousand or 500. Um, if uh, it is up to the department. So if you guys want to hold that person's credit, they, um, if you want to hold that person's credit, then it's only 500, I believe, right? If that's right. Um, that's right, I think. But uh, what I recommend is doing uh, the full amount minus the flight of the minus the value of the flight voucher, just in case the traveler wants to use a flight voucher for something else. Um, and you don't have to worry whether the flight voucher might be used for personal or anything like that. I would just do full amount minus the value of the flight voucher. Alan says, for federal grants, if an airfare is canceled by you and you purchased a non-refundable ticket, you cannot be reimbursed for the fare of high budgets funded by a federal grant. Our department requires us to always purchase the most economical refundable airfare. And yeah, that is correct for your department. The lowest logical cost would be refundable airfare. As uh, for federal grants, that is, that is the policy. So uh, again lowest logical cost and that typically depends on your own department's policies okay kelsey asks um does a department have to reimburse if we have certain required meetings on campus written to their telework agreement but the employee is 100 percent remote mm -hmm. What do you think, Renee? Does the department have to reimburse if we have certain required meetings on campus written into their telework agreement, but the employee? Uh, that's a good question. Technically, the department never has to reimburse. Yeah. So I think that is probably up to your department's determination. If it's written in, then I guess they're not technically fully remote, but... I don't know. That's interesting. Oh, uh, Sam. Yeah, because it's it's written in there, so they have to come. Yeah. So, so I in feel that case, like, that is probably commute, right? Yeah, I would say it, it would be probably commute, and you don't have to reimburse for it. Um, yeah. since it was written in the agreement. Mm -hmm. Robin Smidley has a Robert question. 
I've been told if the hotel is paid using the spouse's credit card and the charges for the traveler, as long as the bank account is a joint account, we can reimburse the traveler. That is correct. But uh, I think in Robert's question, the spouse was also a traveler and technically is not able to be reimbursed for their side of it, at least. But yeah, but if they do have a joint account and they're both on to business. Then yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Shannon asked, sorry if this is addressed, but is there a limit on the amount of reimbursed for checked luggage or to reimburse whatever the airline charges for the two checked bags? Um, I believe there is a limit. Um, usually, I believe it's the first two checked bags, and then after that, um, any extra checked bags should have some sort of, what's it called, explanation or justification. Most of the time, some people put it as a non-incidental, um, but... Usually it's just the first two text bags are okay. And then if it's a third or fourth bag, or if it goes over the weight limit, you would need a justification for that. Um, but yeah, there's no, uh, uh, there's no like limit on reimbursement of check bags technically, but if you have more than two, you should give a justification or reason why you have more than two bags. Most of the time people say equipment or et cetera, anything that's due to business related and it should be fine. Raquel says, what if the department decides not to require pre-authorization for out of state and out of country travel and just get the authorization from the PI or budget authorized personnel after the fact when the traveler comes back for the reimbursement request? Is that acceptable? Well, per our policies on our website, we do require pre-trip approval, and it is required for all out-of-state travel defined as travel to a location outside the state of Washington, Oregon, or Idaho. And approval must come from an authorized person, which is defined on our website. Uh, you can get, it can be provided on a trip-by-trip -trip basis, but it can also be as a blanket approval for one calendar year. But either way, it will need to be prior that is a requirement uh specific trips included in funding proposal for sponsored research like grant and contract funding do not require prior approval if travel is clearly defined in the documentation and another situation would be if the vis if it's a visitor they're non-uw their letter of invitation may fulfill the prior approval the prior approval requirement and i will put this in the chat as well Okay. But I believe also if you go internationally, they always require you to register. To oh, yeah. Then, then you have to register in uh, with Global Affairs. Mm -hmm. um, Shannon is clarifying her question. Um, if you got a receipt for over $100 for a check bag, usually it's only 30 to 35 If it's the first two check bags, technically, um, we can pay for it. Or the UW can pay for it. The department can pay for it. So, no worries. Oh, are those combined? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ruth says the Q&A is great. Thank you. Uh, Katya says, what if they have a joint account, but the traveler who paid is not on UW business? Then we would have to reimburse burst the traveler who paid, but just for the spouse that is on UW business. We cannot reimburse for people not on UW business as that's considered personal. All right, I think. Yeah. Right, but the full amount, only the amount that is deemed for the traveler on UW business. If that determination cannot be made, then I think it would have to be paid, but as taxable income. 
So, uh, yeah. Unless there was no added cost due to having an extra traveler. So it depends. If you want to send us the specific folio or a situation, we can we can go over it. And all right, as we've gotten through those, Adam Wendell wants to be taken off mute and ask over voice. I think we have some time. So yeah, we can do that. Let me find him. All right, Adam, you can talk. Okay, so I have a professor in my department who's teaching a class, and uh, as part of her class, she needs to take students to uh, several locations uh, from between Tacoma and Seattle um, about seven, six, seven times during the fall. Uh, she does not have a driver's license. So she wants to try to rent a U-drive it car, but that requires a driver's license. So one option I suggested, but I don't know if it's feasible, is to have her hire a Lyft or a Uber driver with a like a minivan, obviously, where she could transport the required number of students that she has to take. Would that be reimbursable uh, as a as an expense. It's, I don't know if it's gonna meet the travel related requirements that she's on business travel of the 50 miles and 11 hours, I doubt it. But uh, being that she does not have a driver's license herself and the UCAR website says family members cannot drive uh, the UCAR vehicle for the class. I don't know if she has a, a many other choices or options. Does anybody have any ideas or is would, would this be reimbursable just as a, a non-travel expense, I guess? I mean, it's a quasi-travel expense, but you know, if she hires a Lyft driver or Uber driver to transport the class, that's my question, I guess. Well, for... Um... The 50 miles and 11 hours you mentioned is uh, the requirement for travel status for to receive meal and lodging per diem. So you don't need to meet those requirements to claim mileage or car services. Oh, okay. So technically, you know, if your department allows it, they have authorization, so she, okay. it could be done so, as an ER. A follow up on that then, she could actually then use her private vehicle and have her whoever drives it and then be in reverse the miles even if it's like only 20 miles round trip or something right yeah, yeah. okay okay that might be cheaper <laughs> okay i'll let her know that's an option then probably if she can't get a u car because of the driver's license issue mm -hmm. all right well thank you very much no problem thanks for the question just kind of she doesn't have Okay, Kelsey is adding on to the question, volunteers can, I believe, that's the volunteers. The volunteers could drive the U-car, that is true. Yeah, I think uh, oh. so long as they provide like the requirement, doc the required documentation for mileage, then we don't, we have no uh, requirement for who has to drive if it's a personal mm -hmm. vehicle. Yeah. Same with right. Wendy's question. I love all years. the suggestions here, though. Yeah. No group effort. You know, has a contract with student first bus charter. Oh, oh yeah, she could yeah. do that too. Cool. Separately in the chat to, to us, Jules says, how can she drive her private car without a driver's license? Overall, I'd be concerned about the liability of transporting others on UW business in a personal vehicle. Well, uh, if the professor is comfortable with that, we, we, don't, we don't have any regulations on that. That is up to the professor's comfort level. Oh, she has her husband drive. Yeah, then that's probably better than a student driving. Well, 
like we recommend like obviously recommend that they have a driver's license we're not saying to drive without a driver's license oh no definitely not no. but um someone who has a driver's license <laughs> could drive <laughs> um, okay thank you for all the suggestions people uh, Annette says, apologies, I missed the response for the following question. Um, oh, I think Sam, you answered that one. Yeah. It's, uh, so if it's an overage, um, like the per diem rate, like you said, is 160 and they, the hotel charge is 180, they would have to um, fit the lodging or overage in one of the per diem exceptions, um, which should be pretty easy if, as long as it's a if it's a conference hotel or they can use the lower cost overall, again, there's six options to use. Um, if it can fit into there, then they can get the reimbursement um, for the overage as well. If it doesn't fit into the six per diem exceptions, then um, the overage cannot be reimbursed. They can only be reimbursed to per diem rate. Okay. Rent a bus. Yeah, renting okay. a bus probably would be best. I guess we don't know how many students this person has. Um, All right. Looks okay. like we've reached the end of the questions. Technically, we still have 30 minutes on the call. So if anyone has any questions, we'll be here. No problem in it. Okay. So Ruth Levy asks, do we have to reimburse 100% remote or is it up to the department? It is always up to the department. Jean mm -hmm. says, did you answer mine? I believe we did. We answered all of them. Oh, in the chat, the faculty one? Oh, did she have a question in the chat? I think so. Oh, well, please put questions in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Can an over, Savant, Savina says, can an overage over per diem can be placed on a discretionary budget? Yes. But we should note discretionary budgets are not exempt from uh, audits. And if questions, you will still need to have a uh, you'll still need to have a business justification and you will need to allow it for all other travelers in like scenarios. And Gene, I'm not sure what question you're asking, but if you are if you mean the question in in, that you put in the chat directly to us, if you could put that in the Q&A section and we can answer it there. Heather, I have a question. Can you recap travel approval that is part of a government grant? like federal funding. I think it would be the same, right, Sam? Pre-approval. That is part of a government. It, yeah, there would be like any, it wouldn't depend on whether if it's on a grant or not. It's just for the trip in general, you would have like, if you, again, like Renny already said, if you go out of the little um, tri-state area, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, you would have to get a pre-trip approval through an authorized person or um, internationally you have to register either way. So. Yeah. Uh, but I think one thing that might be relevant is uh, so that part about if the trip is specifically uh, included in the funding proposal for the research in the federal 
grant, then that does not require prior approval if the travel is clearly defined in the documentation. Let's hold there for. Um, Max continues. This, um, no worries. Uh, you said the individual could pay back the university for the difference between what was pre reimbursed minus the value of the flight voucher. I believe as earlier I said. The password problems are not covered by the cancellation policy. They have to pay the full amount. They were pre-embraced, so I just want to make sure I let them know how much they have. Let me go back to your question. Let me see. Um, I'll turn over there. I don't remember which one, what you prepaid for Linux or what was prepaid. The flight registration. So you already paid for, oh, you paid for the flight. Sorry, I was thinking hotel. Um, yeah, then you, oh, okay. So if you already paid for the flight, if you pre reverse for the flight and they have a flight credit uh, for it, um, you can technically, Technically, you don't have to reimburse or ask for the flight, or ask for the reimbursement back for the flight. The flight would just be for the university or be under your department already. Um, and that person can only use the flight for a future future business flight or trip. For the registration, you can ask for a check to the university. Um, you just need to make sure that the traveler honors um, and doesn't use the flight for something else. Um, if you don't think the, if you don't ask the traveler, you can ask them for the reimbursement of the flight. But usually if um, they've been reimbursed for the flight already, um, they would just need to hold on to the flight and the flight can only be used for you to business, but definitely ask for a check for the registration. Okay, there, I see Jean's question. Uh, lately, I have been changing the default information to the actual information. For example, car service, I've changed to Uber, Lyft, and or cab. Also, I've been changing airfare to the actual airline, e.g. Alaska. Is this an issue? No, that's great. I love it when uh, we can clearly see what expenses are for. So keep that up. Um, pre reimbursed a thousand max continues. Uh, pre uh, the flight was a thousand, the registration was five hundred dollars, the flight voucher was twelve hundred. Does the overage of the flight value of voucher cut into the no? It does not. I'm not sure why they got reimbursed extra. Maybe there is a situation with the airline and something like that, but no, they should be they should write a check for the full. $500. Okay. A lot of good questions today. They paid for an upgrade, not using re being reimbursed, which is fine. Ah, uh, okay. But yeah. Either way, um, if they're not asking for the reimbursement for the upgrade, um, I would still not take the flight credit and like overlap 
they just have to pay the $500 back in registration. No worries. All right, anything in the chat we missed? Doesn't look like it. All right. No problem, Savina. Thanks for coming. All right, we'll stick around for maybe, I don't know, what do you think, Sam? Five, ten more minutes? Yeah, yeah like five, five, ten minutes. Yeah. Five, five minutes, probably. So we'll stick around until 39 or 40. And then if no other questions, we will be hopping off. All right, looks like Jean has a question. Jean says, I have a faculty member who travels around the Washington area visiting companies for his research. Occasionally the lab, the lab members go with him. The students do not request any reimbursement. The faculty member has paid for breakfast, lunch, and or dinner when the students go with him. He's claiming mileage. Would the meals be considered meals paid for others? The faculty member being the claimant? Yes, that is correct. So, so long as he provides for meals paid for others, he will require receipts. We will need uh, fully itemized receipts for all meals purchased for the students to do meals paid for others. But uh, yes, that would be meals paid for others. She has and also then do the per diem. Yeah, you'll also attach um, the spreadsheet or a way that you can just show that's within the per diem. You should be fine. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could disable chat during the QA sessions or default send chat to see everyone's question in chat. A good suggestion. I think we can, I think we did chat for everyone last time. We can probably just do that again next time, yeah. unless we decide otherwise. Thank you, Dennis. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. 
We'll take, we'll be open for another minute or so. Any last any questions anyone has? If not, um, definitely email us or call us. Um, our number is on the website. Um, but that is it. Thank you so much for the last little ones that are left here. Um, we'll be back in February with some more updates. Um, and that's that. I think we have one more in between, don't we? Right. Oh, December. Yeah, okay. yeah. We'll be back in summer. Or, I think we it's because we delayed a month for this one, but yeah. We'll be back in summer. We'll have another one between that. Mm -hmm. But uh, thank you everybody for coming. Mm -hmm.